want you to do something for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I, I want, I want to analyze our scientific uh, colleagues here now. I'm not saying they're children. I think they can count. <laughs> uh, but does cognitive psychology give us insight into how science develops and particularly how, how theories can change? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, that's a very large topic in cognitive psychology and cognitive development. The, the short answer is change comes with great difficulty when it comes to scientific theory. Um, to back up on that, the mind is a learning machine such that it has organizations that it prefers to use as opposed to not use, like any biological entity. So if you already know something in an organized way, and it's very easy to learn more about it. About the same thing in the same way. Well, it needn't be exactly the same thing, but for example, if you know something about numbers, it's easy to learn there's another number or um, another language for numbers. But if you don't know anything, let's say about negative numbers, mm -hmm. it's very hard to learn about them. And the reason is straightforward. These are different structures. And given the mind prefers structure and likes it, mm. if you don't have one to start with, you've got this enormous problem of mounting a new conceptual structure without any data. Well, and it's sort of a chicken and egg question then. It's a question of a little bit like, how do you get to the middle of the lake without a rowboat? It's very hard to get scientific change, to get changes in f of the kind that Newton made, where you went from not distinguishing between acceleration and velocity to having them as critical concepts. Well, let, let's stick with that. Let's talk about a breakthrough. I want to see how that works in science. But first, what would you call a breakthrough? What is a breakthrough? Neil, in your area. <coughs> well, I have to, I have to make a, an important distinction here. Uh, one of them is, yes, there are breakthroughs and shifts in our worldview that have happened in the history of science. And we all know most of them. Galileo brought about some, Copernicus, Newton, and Einstein. However, however, daily, what goes on in science is not that. And yet breakthroughs still take place. There are a whole lot of things that we've learned in science that did not require either a pre-existing framework or didn't require us to unthink something that we right. thought before. Because there's nothing there to think about before, it's just something new. Right. Yeah. For right. example, when we learned, and by the way, Sir Fred Hoyle played an important role in, in learning that heavy elements in the universe were forged in the middles of stars, stars that blew up, spread their material around the galaxy, and led to the formation of planets and life. That didn't require any shift in paradigm. It didn't unearth some previous conception. We just didn't know before then where we got the elements, and there it was. Well, that was a legitimate breakthrough. And it was, it was, it was a tremendous yeah. breakthrough, but it didn't have this problem that you're referring to about having to requiring a new, new receptors in order to receive the new idea. Because the new idea, it made perfect sense once we saw the data. It didn't contradict uh, an existing... We had no previous right. things to contradict. It helps right. to right. not... But and I, and I submit that most scientific discovery unfolds in just that way. I understand, and I am inclined to agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> it does mean, first of all, we don't change theories very quickly. That's right. Um, but that's good. That's don't good. change successful yeah. ones. You, right. successful you're, you're, ones you're, you shouldn't be in a rush to throw away a theory on the basis of one experiment that doesn't work. But there's a different point of view on this, which is the transmission of the knowledge that all of the scientists sitting here have to our youth. And they have an enormous amount of difficulty coming to understand what we do know were breakthroughs in science historically. Why is that? Well, the natural way to think about the way things move in space, for example, uh, is rather close to an Aristotelian theory of motion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's so foreign to modern scientific thought about motion that you, what you have here are two structures that have no overlap. And you not only have to get rid of one, you have to mount a new one. Change the meaning of terms. Well, and compounding that is the strange conservancy that goes on in our educational establishment. Uh, the relativity is no more intrinsically difficult to understand than Newtonian uh, mechanics, and yet every generation is first taught Newton, then relativity later on, as if they, as a, like a doctrine of original sin. They all they have to 
re keep recapitulating <laughs> the historical process by which we got to relativity. Uh, I have no idea why, except that there are very few uh, high school teachers who uh, are equipped to teach relativity, it's so not they're a happier bad reason, not doing of course. it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not well, an way, inappropriate it's one. It's a bad reason, but <laughs> yeah, it's a fact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In a way, the worst reason. Yeah. You know, there is a, a case that's interesting, though, in terms of a shift in the educational system. In the 1600s, Pepys wrote in his diary about how proud he was that he was teaching himself long division. It used to be you had to go to Cambridge and Oxford to learn <laughs> law division. We now have it in every fourth grade in the country. I or assure you, you know, yeah. that doesn't mean kids understand division. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I have a very simple de definition of a breakthrough mm. in science. A breakthrough is a answer, a, a solution to some problem that opens up new yeah. questions. A major breakthrough is one that opens up mm. major questions. Mm. Small breakthrough opens up small questions. And of course there are the kind of incremental um, discoveries which really don't open up anything that is filling in but little gaps. Of science. But, but, but there are you know, breakthroughs come in, in many sizes and, and I think any important breakthrough opens up new questions, questions that we have not thought of asking before or we had no way of answering. Well here's a question I've thought of asking before. I want to go through some of the basic categories of science and I'd like everybody to give me their thinking. What is the next breakthrough that is going to occur? What you'd like to see? Uh, just your, 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 your feelings. So let me start with physics. Neil? Uh, you mean major scientific whatever. breakthroughs yeah. or little what scientific you, whatever breakthroughs? You, whatever you <laughs> think <laughs> the next things are going to happen that would be of interest. But let me just tell you just briefly there are many little breakthroughs which taken in totality becomes something big. Mm -hmm. uh, one, like, like what like comes that. to mind, of course, was the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. It, there was Mercury mostly understood with the laws of Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. but there were some differences. And by the way, the last time that problem had taken place, it was with the planet Uranus. It was not following Newtonian law. People said, well, Newton has been right for so often. Maybe there's some other planet out there influencing mm -hmm. it. No Let's apply Newton's law. There it was, out came Neptune, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Now the Senate, now comes Mercury. There's something it's doing we don't quite understand. It worked the first time, let's do it again. Newton, give us another planet on the other <laughs> side of the sun. In fact, it was called planet Vulcan <laughs> that might have been influencing the, sure enough, it was not explainable by Vulcan and it required a whole new paradigm of thought and it was general relativity. Right. So th that was a little thing that presumably could have just been swept under the rug or just explained by some traditional ways that required an, an extraordinary way. So what's coming next? What's coming next? Uh, I think what I'm, what I'm looking for, I'm, re I'm ready for, <laughs> is we know, we have almost incontroversial, incontrovertible evidence that Europa has an ocean underneath Europa's its icy surface. Moon Europa is one of the moons, moons of one of the many moons of Jupiter, Jupiter right? one of the larger moons big, of Jupiter. Big, right? uh, fittingly, it was one of the few moons that, in fact, Galileo discovered. Mm -hmm. uh, it's covered in ice, yet the ice, you look on the, in the, the surface of the ice, and they're like, they're flow patterns mm. and fracture patterns that mm. indicate that there's something liquid below it. Mm. And we know that Europa is being pumped with energy from Jupiter through tidal variations mm. in the forces of Jupiter on to that planet. And it's like playing squash with a squash ball for a long time where a racquetball, the ball gets hot if you hit it enough. Um, a similar action is taking place. So there's a source of energy and you've got liquid water. And any place on Earth where you've got a source of energy and liquid water, you've got life. And so it's tantalizing to think that in the old days we used to think that life, that life required the sun mm. as the sole source of energy, but w that concept is being broadened now. This whole echo zone around stars where you, like Goldilocks, it wasn't too hot, otherwise the water would evaporate, not too cold, otherwise it would all be frozen. Be just right with liquid water. We might have liquid water in other places mm. in the solar system. But I can't wait. Let's uh, talk about biology. Francisco, what do you see in the life sciences? Well, if I would know what was going to be the next breakthrough, I would make it, and I would get a lot of credit for it. So let me say something, Harry, which has happened, because one of the few cases in biology where biology has become big science mm. is in the Human Genome Project. And there it is. Which is the, the study of the, the, the genetic material to get right. every the, sequence of genes. Getting every letter in the makeup yep, of the right. DNA, DNA of right. a human being. Now, that is going to give us lots of answers to lots of questions concerning disease, and it's going to open up new questions in, in all sorts of ways, uh, including functioning of the nervous system and the